Thank you. Hello. So I just want to give you a quick uh, info about References. I'm going to talk about EuroPython and PyCon DE. Uh, who knows EuroPython? Quick. Okay, half of it. Okay. Who does not know EuroPython? It's the biggest European uh, Python conference. The last year we were in Italy, actually in Rimini. This year we're going to be in Edinburgh, Scotland. Um, uh, so we just thought to move EuroPython to the UK before Brexit. Um, so um, if you don't know EuroPython, it's a... Uh, yeah, we're very happy to be there. Uh, so uh, EuroPython is in Edinburgh. It's a beautiful city in Scotland. It's the capital of Scotland. And uh, we will have... Uh, the different conference layout than in the last year. So uh, we uh, have a um, uh, feature of PyData track, but there's like, a, um, it's a general Python gathering for everything in the Python world. Uh, but we've changed the conference layout here. So it's not uh, five days of talks and trainings anymore. Now the trainings are on the first two days on Monday, Tuesday trainings, workshops, beginners day, Jungle Girls. And the main conference is cut down to three talks only, we did that because we had many requests. People say, my employer does not let me go for five days of conference. So, um, so. but we added another track, so it's less, it's less talk slots. So it's a little bit more competitive. It's even more competitive, but it should not scare you away to uh, uh, propose great papers to us. Uh, but uh, we have uh, added a sixth track. So we still have like 120 slots left. And then there's two days of sprints. Um, we are unfortunately unforeseen. We have to fight some VAT and tax issues uh, with the uh, UK. Um, um, as you might know, EuroPython is run by the EuroPython Society, a Swedish uh, non-profit organization. And if you think, oh, in Europe it's all very easy, no, VAT for conferences is quite complicated. So we need to register in the UK to account for the value added taxes. So uh, we're a little bit delayed with the ticket sales. Uh, so I'm very sorry, I apologize, but you can can totally plan with the dates. The call for participation will open very soon. Tickets will open at the same time. We I hopefully to expect it next week. So get ready, propose, make your best papers ready because we're on a little tighter um, uh, uh, timeline here. So to uh, get updates, um, EuroPython and Twitter or the website. Um, and then? I also run another conference, um, uh, PyCon DE, because I'm from Germany. Um, so uh, last year we had the PyCon DE in Karlsruhe, and it was such a great conference. We thought, okay, let's do it again. Um, if you never heard of Karlsruhe, it's located here in Germany. Uh, it's one of the um, major IIT hubs in Germany. It has the KIT, which is a very well-known uh, engineering university. Uh, it's very well connected, so basically you can uh, from take the train via Munich from to northern Italy, if you're from northern Italy. Uh, there's an airport. Uh, Frankfurt is also very well connected. Paris is just three hours by train or five hours by train from London, maybe, or flight, so it's easy to get. Um, we have a great venue there. Uh, it's actually a museum for uh, tech media technology uh, and art. Um, uh, this is the place we were the last year. We had uh, even like the trainings in a running uh, open codes exhibition, uh, which was like pretty awesome. So um, we really love the venue. That's why we will come back. Um, this is the last year's crowd. We had like 420 uh, attendees, uh, and they I think they look quite happy. So um, here are the dates for this year. It's uh, again end of October at the ZKM. Two days of sprints, 24th, 26th. Um, Conference is all run in, Eng in, in, in English language, although we're in Germany. So, um, and we're also going to open the call for proposals and everything very soon. Okay. Next, 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 next. The next talk, it's about come to PyCon Web. So, who of you knows PyCon Web? Who've been there last year? Oh, that's, yeah. who knows? Who've been there? All right, there is some room for improvement. Well, one thing you probably do not know about PyCon Web is that it's heavily, heavily influenced by this conference of PyCon Italia. Because when we've been uh, studying like how to do events, we thought, well, these guys are the ones who definitely know how it works. So we borrowed a lot from here. 
and now it ta it's time to pay back. So I'm not just advertising you the conference right now, even though it's obviously very awesome. But you can see it yourself. Uh, just go on pyconweb.com. There is uh, feedback from last year, a lot of pictures, video, and stuff. But not now. What's about now is uh, we just started the early bird sales, and they were gone like in two days. And I was feeling sorry that I'm here giving you the full prices. And that's not cool. So just for next three days, there is a special discount. And it's obviously called Pai Cappuccino. <laughs> because I thought that, yeah. That Italians know how to spell it right, so it won't go too wild, you know? It kind of stays in the, in the limited field. Uh, yeah, and it's Italian, so we spoke with the team and it's like perfect deal, I think. Yeah, so please take a picture of this slide if you are interested to have it. It's spikeonweb.com and the code Pi Cappuccino, case insensitive, no worries. And for the next three days, you are welcome to get it on the very special secret deal. And I hope to see you guys in Munich because uh, we are really open to other communities. Uh, our conference is totally international, even the crew. So, yeah, looking forward and thanks for your attention. Okay, so here is Supply 2018. Are you curious? Maybe? Right. So, very brief overview of the previous locations of this conference. It started back in uh, 2008 and 9, it was in Germany. Leipzig, exactly. Then moved to France, then Brussels in Belgium, then Cambridge in England, back to Germany. And so, Every, every two years, this conference is moving, and so uh, for the next year, it will come back in Germany. No, sorry, uh, it's it's Italy. It's some people think it's it's not Italy anymore, but anyway, uh, it's going to be Italy. Uh, this is going to be the the location, if you guess. But uh, especially, this will be the final location. So we're going to have Pi 2018 on late August 28th up to 1st September in Trento. Um, thanks to the guys from Python Italia and FBK, Fondazione Bruno Kessler, that helps us organizing the conference. Um, the call for people it is open-ish. It will be open by next Monday uh, and it will stay open for three weeks. Uh, these are the topics of interest, so vector array manipulation, power computing, scientific stuff, machine learning, deep learning, and uh, whatever you call it, uh, algorithms implemented. If you want to uh, present your projects, ongoing projects, uh, completed projects, whatever you want. We have the, the conference structures in five days. Actually, I forgot to, the, to say this in the slides. The conference is structured in five, uh, in five days, yes. Um, Ten, uh, basically last uh, five days. The first two are tutorials, only tutorials. The next two days are talks, and the last one is for sprint. Um, this is uh, uh, a sort of mix, uh, mixed type of audience, so people coming from academia, so it's a very technical conference, but also has very lots of influence from uh, scientific community, so it's a sort of mixed kind of conference. And for those of you interested, there's also there will be also publications in of proceedings after the conference for talks. So if you're interested, uh, please be posted on the website eurosci.pi.org or eurosci.pi on Twitter, or if you want, send us an email at info at eurosci.pi.org. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. So I work at Jor, it's a fashion B2B marketplace, and we're building our new GraphQL API to cover all of our use cases. Um, for those who don't have context, GraphQL is an alternative to REST where you can get all of your data. Instead of just having to call singular REST endpoints, you can define it on the client side or anybody can define what their, what their uh, request will be. So, this is a sample query, so this is, for example, someone wants to get all the orders and then the user is associated with the orders. This is what it looks like. It returns in a very similar fashion. But the problem is the connections between each node 
in the graph causes the n plus one query problem. So if you're requesting 4,000 objects, you might get 4,000 queries or even more, depending on how everything is set up. And that's not performant at all. So this is what your SQL output would look like, um, which is not usable in production. So the solution is data loader. The solution was created by Facebook as a way to implement uh, GraphQL in their production. And their blessed library is in Node. However, in Graphene, they have their own version. And so it transforms this above query into this query, which is much, much better. Uh, so that's great. It's in theory. It's easy. In reality, it's a little harder to do. So here's a very quick sample of models and uh, what their corresponding nodes on a graph would look like, and then you know what the batch load would look like. So you have a user, you have an order. An order has a user. You have the similar objects that mirror the structure in, the, in on, on your graph. And so this right here is the join. And this is in Django. I'm assuming most of you are somewhat familiar with that. This is pretty simple syntax here. So this will cause all of the joins in your performance problem. So how do you get them into one query? There's the documentation tells you how to do it, but it tells you that you should do it, but it doesn't tell you how, so here's how you do it. So you want a user loader, and you want to say, OK, let's get all the user IDs that we're loading, and we want to return a list of all the users. So let's just do a get on all the users. Let's associate the users with the IDs. So you say, OK, we have the objects, and we have we have the keys and we have the values. Now we want to associate the keys with the values. And then the little bit of magic in data loaders that takes a little bit of grokking to figure out is that the actual way you associate the user IDs with the user output is the position in the list. So the nth is described pretty well here, that the nth position in the input container corresponds to the value in nth position of the output container, an explicit is better than implicit, but here it's implicit. And that's just, we have to live with that because it's ported from node. Um, so we associate the ID with the value. And then how we do it with the, in the resolver itself to say, okay, this is the full stack solution here, is we pass the user ID from the order into the resolver and it does its magic and calls this function, so we get just this single output. And it is performant, and it works, and we can use it in production. Uh, I know this was like one, one minute. One minute, OK. This is, this is stop. Um, <laughs> so I know this is like very, very quick overview into GraphQL. It's very, very powerful. But it's very easy to misuse and dig yourself into a big hole. This is something that we spent a lot of time figuring out and how to, how to do it. And so the, the question that I'll leave you with is, I hope you understood all of this, but how would we, say, do the opposite? How would we write a data loader for the other direction, a different relation? Um, that's an, its own set of problems. Each relation has a different data loader that you need to write for it. But once you complete it, you get the ability to query all of your objects from any client at any, you know, without any major performance issues. So that's GraphQL. Okay, first of all, sorry for, uh, I'm sorry for all the English speakers, because since uh, Django Gore Trieste is mainly uh, a matter of, uh, let's say, internal politics, uh, the talk will be held in uh, Italian. Io sono Eric, dell'associazione Science Industries di Trieste, e sono orgoglioso di dirvi che Django Girls, questa tra un mesetto, sbarcherà appunto nella ridente e soprattutto ventosa Trieste. Chi di, voi <ride> Chi di voi conosce già più o meno Django Girls e sa che cos'è? Ok, Django Girls è una delle iniziative forse più belle che ha la nostra community, è un workshop il cui obiettivo è quello di avvicinare le ragazze alla programmazione, in particolare alla programmazione web, infatti l'obiettivo del workshop finale pratico sarà quello di 
per le partecipanti di implementare un, un loro blog. Ci sono un sacco di informazioni sul sito che vedete nella slide, ma soprattutto ve ne parlerà Raura nel suo talk domani nei dettagli. <ride> Django Girls Trieste è una, diciamo, un progetto che ha il braccio a Trieste appunto tramite la nostra associazione, tramite il collegio universitario Luciano Fonda che ci concede gli spazi in cui verrà effettuato il workshop, ma ha la testa qua a Firenze, nel senso che nasce da una collaborazione tra la nostra associazione e gli amici di Fuzzy Brains qua a Firenze. Le, le iscrizioni sono ancora aperte, la deadline è il 29 aprile, ma sicuramente terremo aperto qualche giorno di più, ma non sentitevi colti in flagrante solo se siete ragazze o donne, perché in realtà anche i maschietti potrebbero dare il loro contributo. Infatti stiamo ancora cercando coach, Anzi, se qualcuno volesse venire a fare un giro a Trieste il 26 di maggio per fare il coach, è più che ben accetto, perché c'è un po' di penuria di coach. Stiamo ancora cercando sponsor, per cui se qualcuno volesse mettere un gettone per darci una mano è ancora più ben accetto. E soprattutto stiamo organizzando anche un Python Meetup che si svolgerà dopo il workshop. Per qualunque cosa c'è il sito, nella slide potete vedere anche i due contatti principali, c'è la mail ufficiale di Django Girl Trieste, c'è la mail dell'associazione Science Industries per tutta la logistica locale, quindi che vogliate partecipare come partecipanti al workshop, che vogliate dare una mano come coach o semplicemente dare un appoggio in termini di vil denaro, ci vediamo a Trieste il 26 di maggio. Ok, so my name is Vitali Bochman, this is my GitHub account if you want to stay in touch. Uh, I would like to talk a little bit about the, how to keep track of the air condition in the environment that you are working on. So a little bit background about this project is uh, uh, I wanted to learn a little bit about pandas and NumPy and how the scientific Python works and play a little bit with uh, Jupyter. Uh, and I needed a project, uh, some problem to solve with that. So i started to tackle the CO2 monitoring, uh, the, the concentration of CO2 uh, in, in air. Uh, so I, I built a simple app that, that uh, consists of, of two um, components. Uh, it, the first component just uh, scans the, the air quality and uh, saves the, the amount of CO2 in, in the air, and the second component just builds some, some graphs and charts and emits alerts if, uh, if the CO2 level is going to be high soon. Uh, why? Well, CO2 is, is, might, a bit, uh, might be a little bit of dangerous. It, it causes some troubles. Uh, and troubles are explained like, like there. And it, it even may ca cause uh, death in some cases. Uh, so how it works, it works like this. This, this is a Raspberry Pi and a simple uh, CO2 sensor. Uh, so the measurement component is, do you, can you read that? Okay, great. Uh, this is a really, really small piece of code. It, it, it's a simple generator that reads the, uh, the value from the sensor and yields it. And there is a wrapper function that uh, iterates over this gen generator with, with a slip of 10 seconds, let's say, and saves the, the values to database. Um, and the, the second component of, of the application is actually builds uh, a forecast for the nearest 15 minutes from now. Uh, and here I have discovered a couple of interesting moments that I haven't, think about, be, be, haven't thought about before doing uh, all this stuff. So, uh, This is the function how to get the training data for the, the machine learning model that we will build later on. And I, since our component that collects the data runs every 10 seconds, but sometimes it, it may miss uh, to, to save the, the data, or it can, in some cases, take a little bit longer than 10, than 10 seconds of delay. So the data isn't really distributed uniformly. Uh, so the two things that you need to know about that is you need to resample the data. Uh, it's on, on 
the third line from, from the bottom. It resembles the data and brings all the data points that you have into exact 10 seconds interval. And the second thing is interpolate the data. So if you have uh, gaps in your data stream, it will fill them with some, some uh, value, like uh, middle value between your uh, left and right values. The second step that you need to do is you need to build the model and make some predictions out of it. So you get your training data, you build a model, you feed the data to, 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 to your model, uh, and you get the predictions to, to the nearest 15 minutes. Uh, and then you can also draw a chart uh, about how it looks like. And it looks like this one. So on the left, you can see how an, an alert looks like, and the resolution is really slow. So if you can see there is a puncture, like a not sharp line over there, that's the prediction part. Uh, so an alert triggers when a predicted value of CO2 becomes higher, like breaches the limit. And on the right part, you can see some stats about how uh, my air quality changes in my room over, over the day. It's 24 hours uh, ch chart. Uh, some, some conclusions that we can make of that, that CO2 level changes pretty rapidly, like extremely rapidly. You just come to the room and it, uh, it, it increases a lot. Uh, and yeah, the code is available right there if you're interested in that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next one. Ciao a tutti. Allora, io mi chiamo Simone. Okay. Mi chiamo Simone per il mondo gas. Lavoro in Oval Money e noi facciamo un prodotto, un'applicazione per accumulare risparmi e in un futuro investirli in un marketplace di investimenti. Io mi occupo eh, di sviluppare back-end utilizzando ovviamente Python. E oggi vi illustrerò un po' la nostra, il nostro stack, la nostra architettura microservizi, so che è un po' una blasfemia perché non sono proprio microservizi ma rende più o meno l'idea. Sostanzialmente abbiamo il nostro API Gateway che è un'applicazione web scritta in Pyramid e è un, una serie di code celery, cioè di code gestite da dei worker celery che hanno, che gestiscono una, una collezione di task divise un po' per domini per ottenere quello che chiamiamo microservizi. E sostanzialmente abbiamo utilizzato questa, questa tecnologia appoggiandosi su Celery, che utilizza Redis come broker e back-end result, e perché ci siamo resi conto che la classica architettura microservizi con comunicazione a, uh, HTTP in JSON uh, ci, ci stava dando troppi problemi, invece questa è una soluzione un, un pochino più, diciamo, semplice. I, I pro che ci sono è avere una code base unificata, che voi direte non è proprio un pro, però quando sono uno o due sviluppatori a lavorarci, avere otto progetti da switchare, eh, in un'architettura microservizi può iniziare a diventare complicato e una, un, una semplicissima gestione delle eccezioni avendo i, i task salary che propagano le eccezioni a chi ha schedulato il task stesso e worker asincroni vabbè. Eh, routing dei task dinamico e configurabile un po' secondo le, le esigenze e, Retry non error, cron job, discovery automatico dei servizi e vabbè, hai availability per definizione, quanto, quando casca un worker un altro gestirà il task e, e lo scaling semplicemente tirando su un nuovo worker che va a gestire una determinata coda. E, I contro sono la code base unificata e Redis utilizzato come, come back-end e come broker ha un, un pochino di problemi ad esempio se casca Redis eh, andiamo tutti a casa e, è 
un overhead enorme quando aspettiamo i risultati. Utilizzando in questo modo Celery abbiamo all'interno della, della web application dei punti in cui chiamiamo task e in polling aspettiamo il risultato, proprio per come è fatto Celery sotto. E probabilmente possiamo migliorare in questo, in, su questa via oppure cambiare totalmente approccio per andare su una roba microservizi più pura, con comunicazione RPC, eccetera. Però per iniziare in poche persone e fare un, rapidamente sviluppare il back-end, abbiamo utilizzato questa soluzione. Grazie a tutti. Ok. So, hello everyone. So, how many of you knows about PyPy and what it is? Cool. Uh, for those who don't, Uh, PyPy is an alternative implementation which has a JIT compiler, which mean, basically means that you can run your Python programs and they are faster than normal Python, like up to 10 times faster, 20 times faster, and etc. So this has been this way for years now, but historically PyPy has a problem with the C extensions because C extensions are written for C, the Python API, which PyPy implements using a compatibility layer, which is... Uh, buggy, complete, slow, and etc. Or at least it was all these, these, uh, these bad things. Um, because uh, we recently we improved a lot in... Oops. <laughs> and now? Good timing. Yes, we improved a lot uh, in the com on the compatibility point of view. But the, the C extension were still uh, very, very slow, and people complained about that. So at some point, I got tired of people hearing people complaining. So I decided to benchmark and make them faster. So here I have some code which plots some graphs. So these are micro benchmarks for uh, calling and using various uh, small parts of the CPython API, like calling a method without arguments, calling method with one argument, calling a simple function using uh, indexing and uh, things like this. Uh, the, the results are normalized to CPython, so the lower, the better. And uh, in the red, the green, and magenta, you can see the, the speed of old version of PyPy, and they were horribly slow. So like to, to call a, a, a simple method with no arguments, it was like three times slower on PyPy 5.8 than CPython. Just a, a loop which calls a function which does nothing. So as soon as you start to use NumPy or SciPy, your, uh, your performance drop. And uh, some, for something, we did a bit of improvement in uh, recent versions like 5.9 or 10, but most of the benchmarks are horribly slow still. But we are about to release PyPy 6, and these are the results. So the blue is still CPython, the red is PyPy 6, and uh, you can see that apart two benchmarks in which we are still slow, all the other are faster than CPython. We are faster than CPython at doing CPython things. So this is just a small part of the C API. The C API is huge. Uh, but uh, basically, we found a way, we know how to improve things now. Uh, we, we can do them one by one and uh, slowly uh, improving things. They, it's enough to write a, a benchmark in which we are slower. We see which API are called most. We optimize them, and the benchmark becomes fast. And uh, the, the more you do, the, the, more, uh, the more API you, you cover, and so your final program are faster on PyPy as well. But what's very cool of this presentation is that this is Jupyter with NumPy and Matplotlib and etc. As, as I said, it works on PyPy. So this is really working on PyPy, not CPython. I just pip installed everything and it just worked. So what's next? Uh, as I said, uh, we need to finish this, this, this work. Uh, to optimize all the remaining C APIs, especially the one which are used the most, then we can conquer the war because as soon as NumPy and SciPy and the CD stack is fast, you don't have any or good reason to keep using CPython, or you have few reasons. And uh, yes, what's missing really basically time and money because, uh, well, PyPy is uh, 
developed on uh, free time, and uh, so that's what's missing. But if someone is interested in uh, speeding up this kind of stuff, I think we, we can just do it, basically. So I'm, I'm done. Okay, let's say that, that you have this, uh, you want to create a new Python project, so you start, you create um, my package with an initpy, my module, and then you start writing tests. So this is your code, just a simple function with a, um, a sum, A and B, and uh, you create a test because you want to, um, to test that the, commu the pr commutative property, uh, property holds. So you create this test case with 1.23 and 4.56, and uh, you assert that this, uh, the result is equal to the, the swap uh, uh, pair of, of numbers. So you run the test and the test passes. So yeah, you just uh, um, basically prove that in one single case, you, uh, your function is correct. So can you call it a success? Well, not really, because you, you prove only a specific case. Uh, the combination 1.23 and 4.56 uh, is a tiny subset of your uh, domain uh, uh, objects, basically. So what do you do? Well, the lazy solution is, of course, that you start writing more test cases. So, for example, you, you pick another pair of numbers, and then you try, and you run the test, and the test, of course, succeeds. But it's not, you are not doing that much, because you are, you are not testing a lot of the input space. So you could um, try fuzzing and uh, use basically random, uh, um, a random generator to create tests. Uh, there is a cool library called DDT, which uh, allows you to write a single test case, but then you can hook it up with a random, uh, um, with a, basically a generator, and then you can have, write hundreds of test cases or mm, mm, uh, thousands of test cases. It writes them for you. But this is a, a little bit dangerous because then this is your output and you are introducing randomness in your tests. And yet, it's still not enough because in this case we are uh, creating random uh, combinations of for, uh, between of numbers between zero and ten, so it's a tiny portion of your input domain. So what we can do? Well, the thing is that we need some way to create domain objects uh, that your function uh, can accept, and if you have enough domain objects, then you are sure that your function um, that the commutative property, in this case, holds for all your input space. One way is to use hypothesis. So with hypothesis, you can write tests like this, so like literally one line, basically. And if you run it, this is the result. So I was very surprised when I ran this test. Uh, and of course, I wanted to understand why the test failed. And uh, in a hypothesis, you can uh, use this verbosity verbose in the decorator, and it will tell you a little bit more about the failure. So from the output, you can understand, you can read that some test cases are fine, like the ones on top, and some other ones are not. And you have, uh, as it's called in the hypothesis lingo, falsifying example, because you need the falsifying hypothesis to falsify your assumptions. So, uh, was it really a failure in, in this case? Well, it depends, because uh, in, in this case it failed because it received a none as an, an invalid, uh, as an input, and you might not have this problem in your function. Maybe your function doesn't accept none, doesn't really produce none. So, what do you do? Um, you create, uh, you, you pass this function, the, these parameters to the, the test, <laughs> and they have, oh, one minute. Uh, yeah, and you are basically controlling the generation of the test cases. But what if you really need to test that your function can accept infinite and none, for example? Well, you need to trigger a specific exception and to test that this exception is raised. Um, so, for example, you create this none is not allowed, uh, infinite is not allowed, you modified your function. And your test fails now because uh, you, you have multiple failures because you have some nonsense of infinite. 
Um, but in a hypothesis, you basically catch the exception and you reject the generation of that exception as a failure for your test. So it's okay that this function uh, raises an exception because it, it means to be this way. So if you try to uh, apply this function to, <laughs> to infinite and none, it doesn't work. Okay. And the lightning talks. Thanks for that.